Hello and welcome back to SaaS Half Full, the only show serving B2B SaaS marketers. I'm Lindsay Grover, president at Blast Media, and I will be both your host and, of course, your bartender today. Uh, today I had a conversation with Isabel Papoulias, who is the EVP of Global Expansion at Mediafly. Now, Isabel's been busy. She has gone through five acquisitions in the last four years during her time as CMO at Mediafly, and she's learned a thing or two. So she's gonna talk to us today about what the marketing team can expect in an acquisition, what their role is, and how to align on expectations with both your CEO and board. So a lot to tackle today. So if you'd like to, grab a drink and join me as I speak with Isabel from Mediafly. Hey, Isabel, welcome to SaaS Half Full. Hi, Lindsay. Thank you for having me. Yes, we've rescheduled no, no less of 150 times, but here we are. I'm glad it finally worked out. I see you've been counting. Yes. I believe the, re I believe the accurate number is three, but I'll go with 152. Okay. Yes, but glad we're finally hooking up. Uh, I've known Isabel for quite a few years. She is a client at Mediafly, which we appreciate dearly. Uh, but we've also had a chance to meet in person on a couple of CMO uh, women retreats, which has been awesome. And hopefully we will again in September. Uh, but I am having a drink for this conversation. Um, after this, we actually have an office happy hour. So I'm just starting a little early. I'm going with a high noon, which is one of my favorites. Uh, I think you are in your office. Um, are you joining me for a drink today? I am not, but uh, I'm impressed. You're starting very early. Uh, so I'm not joining you right now, but I, but I uh, did take the little um, cocktail kit uh, at home and I will be uh, trying it out this weekend with guests. So that was perfect. Love it. Well, initially when I had prodded our account team at Blast Media uh, to have you on the show and said, I'd really like to have Isabel come talk with me uh, because the number of acquisitions that Mediafly has made in the last four years has been pretty intense. Uh, you've taken the company through five acquisitions in four years. And I thought to myself, self, our listeners who are other B2B SaaS marketers likely are going through this process and they might be acquiring companies, they might be uh, being acquired, but I really wanted to lean into what it means as the acquiring company, how it affects the marketing or what advice do you have for them. Um, so you graciously agreed to accept my invitation. Um, but before we dive into the world of acquisitions from the marketing lens, I do want to give people an understanding of who you are and what Mediafly does. Um, since we first connected, you have had a role change at Mediafly, so please tell us what your new role is and then uh, give us a quick overview of what Mediafly does. Great, yes. So I, as of um, five weeks ago, I'm now EVP Global Expansion. Prior to that, I was a CMO for several years, I think three years, VP of marketing prior to that. So, so leading the, the marketing organization for I think a little over four years. And before that, I was in sales. I was an icon executive at Media Fly. So this is my, my third role. I've been with a company for five and a half years. Uh, it's, been, it's an incredible opportunity to be able to reinvent yourself and, uh, uh, and have your, your dream job created for you every, every few years or so, especially in a company that's uh, you know, mid-size, that's not huge. Uh, so um, I like to say Media Fly is the career gift that uh, keeps on giving. Uh, the company has changed tremendously when I started. Um, at the core, we were a sales enablement company uh, focused on really content management way back when. Uh, today, as a result of our fearless leader, CEO Carson Conan, his vision and the many acquisitions we've made, uh, we are the only company that, that brings together sales enablement and revenue intelligence capabilities uh, so that one informs the other, right? So, so we see ourselves as very much the the revenue engine that helps uh, sales leaders and CMOs, revenue teams, you know, uh, customer success, um, understand uh, what behaviors drive our revenue, um, coach on those uh, behaviors, and um, and encourage, you know, the the through sales enablement again technology uh, and coaching the the behaviors that work. And the more the teams are taking those behaviors, the more that, that informs the analytics, the more we understand what works, the more we improve the enablement. So that's really the idea here is uh, with more intelligence, enablement gets better and uh, you know, the wheel just goes around. But the end game is to, to help uh, revenue teams uh, get better at what they do every day so they can generate more revenue. I love that. And I swear some of the 
best and brightest CMOs that I know came originally from members of the sales team. So uh, they understand then how to create that sales and marketing alignment. So no surprise that that is where you had your roots. Um, so you have been through a lot of acquisitions. Uh, what went through your head when Carson first told you that, Isabel, we are going to acquire a company? What went through your head? <laughs> that was a long time ago. The first acquisition was, I think, about four years ago. What probably went through my head then was a complete freak out um, uh, moment. Um, I can't remember, but it's, um, no, truthfully, it was excitement and uh, a little bit of, uh, and feeling scared at the same time. We, it was the first time for all of us. I mean, it was the first time for MediaFly. It was the first time for most of us uh, on the executive team. Uh, so, you know, we were novices and or beginners uh we we did some things well and some things not well and we've learned a lot since uh and we've definitely i wouldn't say perfected uh but i would say close enough uh you know we feel much better about our acquisition playbook and how we do things um before during and post acquisition across the entire organization uh, something that's talked about a lot is the disruption that happens when your company is acquired, when you exit through acquisition. What is not talked about as often is the disruption that happens also within the acquiring company. Um, and that's something I really latched on to in our, in our previous conversation, so I want to unpack this. Um, talk to me about the uh, less talked about disruptions that happen for acquiring companies that you've experienced. Yeah. So I would say, and I love that, I love that, um, you know, obviously the, the, there's a lot of disruption on the company being acquired because at a basic level there's, there are a lot of unknowns, you know, uh, uh, and that, uh, especially for people, right, well, still have a job. I mean, that's just question number one that people ask themselves and that's, val that's absolutely valid. There's disruption, uh, so on the, on, the, on the company acquiring, there are, there's disruption on multiple levels, so there's disruption um, in terms of workload, um, as I like to say, you know, people had, everybody had a full-time job before the acquisition happened. <laughs> they already had a full-time job. Now they had to do their full-time job plus work to make this, uh, this acquisition um, a success and integrate the two companies. That's on top of what you were doing before, right? I mean, you still have to yes. do all the things you were doing in marketing. Work, prior to that. Okay. Yes. Right. Um, and I, I'm talking about marketing because, you know, that was my, my perspective, but, you know, multiply that for each department in the organization. So there's disruption at the just basic volume of work. Uh, there's disruption in terms of, obviously, people, right? You're, you're bringing a new cohort in. Um, you have to make them feel good about the change. Um, and you have to be empathetic to their concerns and alleviate those, and that's on both sides, right? Um, and while at the same time, most likely, uh, redefining people's roles, both the people that were on the original team and the people that are incoming. Um, so there's a lot of change, and I think over-communicating over and a lot of one-on-one -on -one check ins is what I have found works the most in transparency. Um, is this the best approach? And, I'll, and checking in is, how are you doing? I know this is a difficult moment. I know you probably have a lot of questions. Let's, let's talk. Um, obviously, there's disruption in terms, most likely, especially if it's a significant acquisition and not a talk-in. Disruption in terms of messaging and brand. Uh, so you have to rethink that. You have to rethink your go-to-market strategy. Hopefully, a lot of that has happened pre-acquisition, leading up to the acquisition. A disruption in terms of tech, right? Dis disruption in terms of the tech stack. I mean, you name it, right? There's different levels. And so the playbook from the marketing side, at least, where we go through an acquisition, we have, a, you know, very defined work streams. And it's literally a, play a playbook, as you can imagine. It's an Excel document with multiple tabs. And it's just the different work streams that we need to, to pay attention to. The, the tech stack, the demand gen, the messaging, the content, and so on. And then we... Um, you know, we define um, the roles through a RACI and, um, and um, regular check-ins on, you know, where are we at, what's the status, what's the next step. Um, what's also important during that time is um, managing expectations um, uh, to the top and sideways <laughs> across the organization. 
precisely because there's so much work to be done, like I said earlier on, right? You, you have to do your, your, the job you had before plus more. And so hyper prioritization is key. Not, we can do everything uh, and we can do everything quickly and not everything can be perfect, right? So uh, making sure that everyone is comfortable with that, the good, better, best um, approach is, is important as well. So there's a lot, a lot that goes on during that time. Yes, it is not all simply popping champagne and celebrating. There's a lot that goes into it. Uh, and you, you've obviously learned a lot through each acquisition. Uh, for someone uh, that gets the, the call from their CEO or into the office and they, they drop this news on them, um, as a marketing leader, what is the first thing that they should do when they get that news? So... This is an interesting question because ideally, ideally that's not how it happens. And I smile because, you know, it, it, that doesn't mean that it happens the ideal way all the time. But certainly one of the things I've learned and we've learned as an organization is that these discussions need to start as early as possible, like way, way early, not a few weeks before uh, even a letter of intent is going to be signed. Uh, it, just when it, it, it really, it's part of the the the, 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 the business plan, right? The, the company vision. Like at, at any given moment, the executive team should know what's in the CEO's head. To be blunt, right? Um, especially when you have a CEO that's as visionary as our CEO and, and many, you know, founder tech CEOs obviously have, you know, big ambitious ideas. Uh, and so one of the things I've gotten much better at, and frankly, I've learned the hard way is asking the right questions um, to our CEO to understand what's in his head and the why behind, you know, why is he contemplating this acquisition? Um, and so I think that's where it starts, right? The moment that there are rumors about that or you hear him start to, her or her talk about a, another company is just extracting the vision and the why. And that's the beginning. Ideally, that becomes the beginning of the go-to-market strategy. Yes. So that, that, thank you for saying that because I did want to, to highlight that is what I'm hearing you say is not just accept the what and move forward. It's digging into the why behind the acquisition because ultimately that's what you're going to have to answer to. The, from a press standpoint, who cares? It's an acquisition. Those happen all the time. Uh, but why does it matter? Why did the business do it? Why does it? Why is it good for our customers? Because that is what that messaging you're going to have to carry through throughout the marketing or or to external audiences, current customers, current partners, current investors. Um, so I did want to highlight that. Don't, don't just take the what. Make sure that you ask the right questions to understand the why behind it. Right. And if I can add more to that. So the thing is, I mean, the reality is many acquisitions happen very fast and we don't have the luxury of time because, you know, they're opportunistic. Kind of like you have to strike when the iron is hot and things happen quickly. But you still have to go. Again, I've learned that you still have to go through that process, even if it's you know, you don't have, it's not a year, you know, and it's just a few weeks, you still have to ask the right questions. You still have to pull the executive team together, you or the CEO. But the point is like that go to market conversation needs to happen uh, ASAP because it affects everything and everyone across the company. And it's, uh, and we have definitely, especially with the last two acquisitions have, uh, um, you know, much, much improve that and the breaking down the silos and making sure that the important communication flows to all the right people across the company to make sure that that, that acquisition is, is successful. Um, we, again, we have a very well-defined playbook um, on how to, how to do that. And again, I'm not saying it's perfect and there's always room for improvement, but uh, when I look at the way we've done our last two acquisitions, for example, um, even the last one, I will say, Exec Vision is the company we you know, acquired, I think, two or three months ago. Um, you know, it's constant improvement. Even just you look at the last one and the, the last two before that, and there's been an improvement even there, right? And certainly going back four years ago when we made our first acquisition, I mean, it's night and day. It's night and day. Sure. 
Yeah, in order to actually have a playbook, you have to have successes and failures along the way. Uh, can you share a couple of missteps that you made along the way that you could uh, surface for the listeners? Yeah, <laughs> sure. You know, I mean, and God knows there's been quite a few, but you know, I feel like uh, when I get asked that question, you know, they ask me about missteps and, uh, you, you know, and it's, it's like we, I, I, it's easy for me to focus on the negative because in some ways that's what you remember the most. Sure. I wish I had done this differently, but you know, it's, we've also done some things very, very well, right? Uh, I mean, a couple of things that come to mind. Um, it, one is, you know, when speaking of go-to-market strategy, when we made our second or third acquisition, um, I forget which one, I think it was, a, I, I'm losing track, uh, but it was our acquisition, uh, an acquisition out of the UK. Uh, we candidly, I feel like we, we rushed through the go-to-market strategy and and we, it felt like we had a solid plan. Uh, the plan didn't go as planned. So the marketing team delivered on the plan really well, but turns out that's not what we wanted. Uh, in a nutshell, there was an opportunity for us, to, for us to expand our TAM. At the time, we were known as very much like an enterprise, a niche company for enterprise, very premium, and we were looking to... Uh, expand and take sales enablement to the masses. We called it at the time sales enablement for all, democratizing sales enablement, also including going down market, right? being able to uh, also engage uh, SMBs. Uh, and that, you know, for a variety of reasons and the capabilities that our, that acquiring company was bringing to us. Uh, and, you know, it, it worked in a sense that, yeah, we saw exponential pipeline growth and in some ways everybody and their brother wanted to, 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 to come and talk to us, you know, all the smaller companies. But we, what we hadn't factored in was that the, our own internal infrastructure and resources weren't ready to um, take on that kind of scale. And so we found ourselves plainly put, with a sales team and a customer success team that wasn't large enough to take on the increase in leads that we saw as a, re as a result of the acquisition of the campaign. And so we realized that, okay, maybe this sales enablement for all and going down market thing wasn't, <laughs> wasn't quite what we're supposed to, we weren't quite ready for our time expansion. We didn't really uh, mean and we all, down. in fact, all. Exactly. So we... At that point, we revisited and redefined our ICP, our ideal customer profile, and that led to you know a lot more success later. So again, you, I mean, in some ways, you can say it's a good problem to have, right? We could have put the campaign out there and 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 rolled out the go-to-market strategy, and nobody cared. Yes, <laughs> nobody. Better so, than the alternative. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but that but that's interesting, right? It goes to show you that it's not. It's, it's not just a marketing plan, it's truly the whole go-to-market. Like, what are the implications on sales? What are the implications of customer success? And so on. And so um, there's that. And then the, the, the another example is, you know, and, uh, is, and I talk a lot about not rushing when you go through an acquisition, which I know is counterintuitive. Uh, but if it's not broken, don't fix it. So when we made... I believe that was our first acquisition of Alinean, which is uh, their value selling tools, and, and uh, Alinean was a leader in that space, but it was a very small company, right? Very niche, very small, I think maybe only 20 employees. We underestimated the awareness and the positive perception of the Alinean brand. We shut down their website three months after the, the acquisition, and we were very proud of ourselves because because I remember going through this. They were like, "We're amazing! Look at that! We've integrated. We, you know, we're now one website, and their sales team is integrated. And check all the boxes: tech stack integrated, check, you know." Um, and we lost demand as a result because they were very well known, and then we pulled them into MediaFly, and no one could find them because really? they knew the Alinean name and it meant something. So we, we had to do some corrections there and re-inject the Alinean name into our marketing uh, campaigns. But, um, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting. And I think it's a little, I know I said don't rush. And it's counterintuitive because truly my experience is the pressure when you're going through acquisition is, almost, is the opposite. You know, I mean, right. the, the, is do everything really fast because the board has expectations. They want to see results, investors. Um, but that's, um, you know, that has, there's a balance. There's a balance. 
And I think, again, that's where good, better, best comes in. Okay. You've mentioned the word expectations a couple of times. Um, what are the expectations of the marketing organization in an acquisition? Are there metrics, measurements of success, or what are those expectations on the marketing org? Uh, that's a good question. I think it really depends on what type of acquisition it is and how many you've done and also the size of the, the company. Um, you know, the I mean, at the core, marketing metrics are always about pipeline and revenue, like period of a discussion. You, you always want to generate demand and you want to uh, align with sales to be able to close, right? So that doesn't change. Now it's the expectations are even higher because, hey, you've acquired another company, you've improved your product, maybe even you expanded your ICP, you know, I don't know. Um, you have more opportunities to basically generate revenue. So guess what? Revenue goals are higher and we expect you to drive more demand. Like that's usually the, the, the standard KPIs. But, uh, you know, if you're at a point where you've made a lot of acquisitions and your platform, you know, and that's sort of like the nirvana for most SaaS companies today, um, there could be more of a priority, let's say, on cross-sell and retention. Because there's really a time expansion opportunity within your existing customer base at that point because you've made acquisitions, your product portfolio has expanded, you have a lot more to provide to your customers, and at that point you may be, any given customer may be using only one of your, uh, let's say, five products, and so you have an opportunity to cross-sell the other four into them. And as a company, you might shift more towards um, expansions, uh, you know, to your within your customer base, uh, cross sell, upsell, then let's say net new logos, uh, and so you'll look at those KPIs even more. You know, how successful are we in cross selling, um, and uh, and and at keeping and expanding those customers or so retention. Okay, so it sounds like still unrealistic expectations and pressure on the marketing mark to perform, uh, <laughs> despite the fact that OPS in the background were fucking bringing in 20 new people that were trying to assimilate into a team and figure out their tech stack. But like, forget all that. Where's the pipeline? That's, a, that's, that's fine. Yeah. So however hard it was before, just multiplied by 10 with that acquisition. Uh, I'm joking, <laughs> sort of. Um, but the... And here's the other challenge, right? So that, that we also haven't talked about. So you, you know, just because all of this is happening doesn't mean your, your marketing budget is expanding <laughs> along, you know? And it doesn't mean that you're getting the, the people resources, right? So depending on the acquisition, I mean, one of the things we do very, very well, and again, kudos to, our, uh, to Carson Conan here. Um, you know, he calls them aqua hires. We have gone and exceptional talent through these acquisitions. And I can think of many, many people like off the top of my head uh, at all levels of the organization. Just absolutely exceptional talent. Um, but that doesn't mean that you get consistently get more and more talent, let's say mar in marketing. Right? We're talking about marketing right now. Like the, the engineering team may get, and, and, and kudos to them, right? Chances are you buy, I mean, you're buying another you're buying, it's a, you're buying a product, right? So you're gonna get a lot of engineers, you might even get a lot of uh, customer success managers. It doesn't mean that you're getting a lot of marketing, proportionally getting a lot of marketing people or any marketing people into your team, but you have to do more work. Fair. So that's another, yeah. another layer of challenge. Like yeah. Just another dreamy day as a marketer. <laughs> Uh, we, we talked about uh, welcoming in new team members, uh, marketing team members potentially through an acquisition. Um, I know one, key, one key takeaway that you shared with us was don't rush. Uh, what other key takeaway have you gathered when it comes to bringing in new team members to the acquisition? I'm sure there's a lot of other things, but I, I would say I don't know if this answers your question exa exactly, but I want to double click on people, right? That, of all the things we just talked about, getting into the CEO's head early on, right? Talking go to market very early, will other right, right people across the organization, um, rethinking the implications on the brand, all those things. For me, the number one focus is, has always been and continues to be uh, the people. Um, how do you make the, how do you bring those two groups together? 
right? The, the, the folks that are already on your team that were, you know, in this case, we're talking about Mediafly and the folks that are incoming. Um, and how do you, do you take the team through the four stages of team development? Uh, you know, I like to talk about f uh, storming, forming, norming, performing, which I think are, you know, uh, a psychologist uh, developed those in 1965, actually. But they, they resonate very much with me and they feel very accurate. So how do you guide your team successfully through all those phases? Because, you know, that it's not going to be instant, perfect, you know, a perfect marriage. Like, I mean, it's just, it's human beings, right? Um, and there is going to be friction at the beginning. And, you know, it's, it's where does my job begin and where does yours, where does my job end and where does yours start and so on. It's, well, you used to do things this way, I do them, I'm used to doing them the other way. And then ultimately understanding that we're better together, right? Like you, that understanding how we all work as a team to perform better, but that we all, um, you know, I talk about the marketing village. I mean, it takes a village to do most things in marketing, right? And the, the, the more brain, great brains we have, which we do, like I said, we've just gotten some incredible people as a result of these acquisitions. Like the, the more we can, the, the more we work, we put those brains together and the, the better we get at what we do, uh, but it doesn't happen overnight. And so for me, if we, if the, if the, we're talking about marketing, but I'm sure any leader in, in MediaFly, you know, would, would say the same thing. You're a department head. You're like for me, that's the number one priority. Because guess what? If we, if we can't do that right, if we can't focus on our people, our landing, <laughs> softly, uh, and enabling them the right way, forget about everything else that we just talked about. Forget about the go to market plan and announcement and pipeline and none of this stuff is going to happen because it's 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 the people it is yeah. it, it, the people do the job right it's um, um what advice would you have for uh for a cmo first day let let's hypothetically say where i'm saying in the office let's say first day new marketing team day one What's the first thing that you should do? So this is independent of acquisitions. You mean you start as a CMO, a new company, and you're inherited team that's already there? Correct. Again, for me, it's focus on the people. 100%. 100%. It's have those one-on-ones. Just understand um, what, you know, what works for them, what doesn't work for them, their career aspirations. That's really important. Schedule, you're suggesting to schedule one-on-ones with everyone on their marketing org. A hundred percent. Okay. Good advice. No matter the level. No matter the level. Okay. It doesn't matter, right? And under, and make it about them. Great and advice. And eventually, you want to get the debrief on marketing and their role and what works and what doesn't. You know, and you know what resources do they need and how? What do they feel works within the marketing organization or doesn't? You know, what can be done better and so on. But I think. Uh, the first few conversations need to be about them. Yeah, and I would imagine just because MediaFly is acquiring another company, it, there's still equal business value, and I would think that there'd be times where you inherit a team and you say, well, here's how we do things, and they say, well, here's how we do things, and then it's like, ooh, your way's actually better. Mm -hmm. And then that, again, that makes everyone better, is being yeah. able to come with fresh idea, fresh processes, maybe it's, it's fresh technology, uh, but there's equal business value. It's just because you're the acquiring company doesn't mean it's our way and that we no, don't No, absolutely, absolutely not. And I think you bring up a good point, which is, you know, check, check your own bias. You know, you and I were talking before this uh, or, uh, about... Again, just uh, my, my experience with acquisitions and whatnot. And I know at one point I talked about I had three three takeaways, but uh, that was uh, <laughs> I have more now. But that was one of them: is uh, check your own bias. Like your way is not necessarily the best way. And I like to say there's more than one way to do things right. So consider what others are saying, what they're bringing in, what they've done. And we've seen it, especially in the last two acquisitions. Things, great things that Inside Square was doing. Uh, 
with marketing that we weren't quite doing that way. Same thing with exec vision. So, yeah, it's uh, definitely we're better together. Great. You've mentioned Carson a few times. Uh, he is, you have a great relationship with Carson. He believes in marketing. Uh, that's not always the case uh, when it comes to a marketing leader, uh, maybe other members of the, the C-suite. Uh, what do you wish that more CEOs understood about marketing's role in acquisition? That marketing um, is not just the execution arm, right? It's not, okay, we're going to acquire this company, um, make an, you know, let's go make an announcement and that that's where it ends, right? It's actually, in some ways that's the easy, I mean, that is the easy part. I mean, it's a lot of, it takes a lot of work, right, to announce an acquisition, but that is absolutely the easy part. Yeah, the it's done part, at that The hard part, the hard part, no, it's not done, that's the issue. <laughs> the, the hard part is what happens the months prior to the acquisition, again, um, uh, crafting and having consensus on the go-to-market strategy and then what happens after the announcement? Because the announcement is just an inflection point, but then we need, you need to keep that momentum, right? And so how, do, how are you keeping that momentum? Um, also the role of um, the alignment between product and marketing is something that we don't, we talk about more, um, more of that, I think the last maybe six months, I've heard it more like in, in discussions with our CMOs. I think historically we've always talked about sales and marketing alignment for all the obvious reasons. Uh, but as something I've also learned, um, you know, from, from the more recent acquisitions is um, focusing, on, focusing on the alignment with the product organization and how transformative that can be for marketing uh, to be effective. So that's, uh, you know, that's another takeaway there. And I think that having, so I think that's maybe something that some CEOs are also un underestimating. You know, there's so much emphasis put on pipeline, which is understandable. Yeah. And so with pipeline, working with sales to understand what works and what doesn't, and how uh, work with sales to move deals through the funnel, the way to close and so on. So much of the, um, the work of marketing is focused on that, that I find sometimes we, ignore the contributions in marketing can make on the product side in terms of understanding, you know, keeping our finger on, on the parts of the market, understanding the market, understanding customers' needs and wants, understanding trends, um, the, the expanding the role of product marketing and so on. And I think for that, you, need, you know, you need to have a very strong leader on, on both mm -hmm. sides. I mean, having a very strong leader on the product organization makes, and it makes a huge difference in alignment. Again, alignment, I always go back to people because you know we can have the best conversations about all kinds of things and what should happen and technology and this and that. And, but at the end of the day, it's, someone asked me a long time ago, like, where does alignment start? And I'm like, alignment starts because the two leaders agree that they're better collaborating than not collaborating, that they each have something to contribute, that you know, you, you know something I don't and vice versa. And if that appetite or that attitude is not there, we can talk about everything else. We can talk about technology. We can talk about having you know, the right sales reps and whatever the other, all the other and tactical things and messaging. And it doesn't matter if the two leaders don't want to align. Founders, I know you're listening. CEOs, I know you're listening. Bring your marketing lead in early align on expectations and show a little bit of grace for that team as they are working their tails off and still keeping the lights on all of the other stuff that has to happen in the background and give Great them a lot more money they need more budget and that's right and give more money damn it more more give me more i want more <laughs> <laughs> well, this, this has been awesome. Uh, as we end every episode, I like to ask our guests if you have a signature or favorite toast to send us out. Oh, well, I, um, I'm not much of a drinker, so I'm just going to say stiniyamas, which is Greek for, you know, um, cheers. When you stiniyamas? Stiniyamas. 
So I three words. Know. And it means, I'm Greek, by the way, in case people are wondering, you know, in case you missed it with my last name, French and Greek. Uh, so it means to your health, to our health. I love that. Well, I will certainly drink to that. Thank you so much, Isabel. Appreciate the time. Thank you. Thanks again to Isabel for joining us on SAS Half Full. That was awesome. Always love when I get an opportunity to chat with our clients. Uh, hopefully I'll get a chance to see Isabel again this fall during our next CMO retreat. Uh, until next time, guys, thank you so much for the listen and bottoms up. <laughs>